Okay. Um, when I was preparing for this, um, God just gave me some scriptures, and he elaborated on it. They're scriptures that I've, I've combed over many times over the years, and my heart has ached every time I've um, read them, but I wasn't totally sure if I would ever teach out of them or not. And then a friend of mine and I were reading through here one night, and it just struck my heart again. It just struck my heart so hard. And I actually saw why it was that every time I read it, it would burn within me. I mean, we can look in the Old Testament, and we can see that it is a type and shadow of the church. It's a type and shadow of um, God's reign. It's a type and shadow of the world system. It's a type and shadow of the religious system. Everything that we currently have in our lives was back then. It was just a different culture, a different time, um, a different group of people that probably knew a heck of a lot more about God than we do. And because our, our, even though we in this church have a close relationship with God and we're seeing re revelation every day, we still, I don't think, see him in the capacity that they saw him because um, the discipline, the commitment, and um, the way that they served God, the ones that really, truly served God, their whole life belonged to him, you know? And I don't think we've quite captured that yet. We want to get there, don't we? But I don't think we've quite captured that, and I think that's something that, you know, we need to continue to press forward and say, God, you know, we want the kind of commitment and fortitude that the people of God need to have because I think even in the United States, we're pretty strong compared to the normal church in the United States, but I still think we're kind of weak and kind of limp-wristed when it comes to actually standing and proclaiming the word of God, you know. It's kind of easy in these walls, and then you get out there and it, you're not as strong as you thought you were, you know, because... When we come in here, we come in here and we come together and there's a strength in that. You feel like you could conquer anything and then you walk out there and you're like, oh, you know, it just, there's something about being in a corporate anointing that gives you tremendous strength. And that doesn't mean that you go out there and, and you don't minister and stuff, but it's funny how when you're by yourself, you don't feel near as big <coughs> as you do when you're with other people that of like precious faith. So <clears throat> I want to um, talk to you tonight about Eli. He was in the book of uh, 1 Samuel. He was the high priest. Um, it's in 1 Samuel. And I'm going to, it, you don't have to follow along with me if you don't want to, because I'm going to um, pop around in there. I'm not going to read everything. I'm going to kind of go over the story with you a little bit, and then I'm going to bring out the highlights that I want to minister on tonight. Because a lot of people, you know, any one of us can take a, a group of scriptures and God can speak to you through, the, through those scriptures. That's why the word of God is so fascinating because it's alive. And I can look at one thing and God can give me a, a total prophetic word for somebody and you can look at it and get something totally different out of it that applies to what you're going through at that time, applies to how you want to teach people or whatever. It's not taking the word out of context, but it's what God is speaking to you at that time. There is people that do take it out of context. I'm not saying that they don't and they do to make it work for them, what making God in their own image like Mike said. But on the other part, God does take scripture and he can speak to everyone and and answer questions and identify places in their heart that need to change and work through them through this alive word. And I think that's what happened. I read this that night, and I just got this burning on the deep deep inside of me, and I'm not even totally sure how this is going to come out. But I do know, for one thing, that it is a, it's a warning for the church, not the church out there, as much as it is for the church in here. We're all the body of Christ. So when God gives us a word, it, we're not supposed to sit here and think, well, that's for that church or that church or the church overseas or whatever. This is for us. We are part of the church. And if it goes out over the airways, any leader that listens to this message has to understand that's for them too. If they're hearing it, it's for them too. So as we go through this tonight, I want you to understand that, you know, 
like I just said, God might speak to the body of Christ as a whole through this, but don't overlook the fact that he might be speaking to you within your own heart about things that need to change and be removed or switched around or grown in you by his word. So I'm going to start in 1 Samuel. And like I said, I'm going to read out of the Amplified Bible. And I just, if you want to write down the scriptures so that you can go back and look through them, that would be awesome. I just don't want you to get distracted trying to find where I'm at and not hearing what I'm saying, okay? I'm going to start in 1 Samuel 2, and I'm going to start in verse 22. Now, let me, before I do that, let me just give you a little bit of background. This, the starting of Samuel is, is talking about Eli, how he's the high priest, who his sons are, and everything. And then Hannah comes into the mix. And Hannah comes, she's with her husband Elkanah, and they come into the temple and they're giving sacrifice. And every year that they go, Hannah is upset because she can't have children. And that is beside, that isn't part of my story, okay? Samuel is. But the part of Hannah isn't going to be part of my teaching tonight. So I just want you to understand that when you go in and you read it again, Hannah is in there, and she's a very big part of what I'm going to, you know, of these scriptures. But I want, is, I want to zone in on Eli and his sons and Samuel, okay? So we're going to start in 22. Now, Eli was very old, and he heard all that his sons did to all Israel and how they lay with women who served at the door of the tent of meeting. And he said to them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all the people. No, my sons, it is not good, a good report which I hear the, Lord pe- uh, the Lord's people spreading abroad. If one man wrongs another, God will mediate for him. But if a man wrongs the Lord, who shall intercede for him? Yet they did not listen to their father, for it was the Lord's will to slay them, which... I'm going, as I read this, I was reading through this and God answered all these things. So I will, the punchline as it is at the end. But I, I want to interject here. Here Eli has two grown sons and he's the priest and he's raised these kids, these men in the, in the church. And these men, by the time they're five, have to um, memorize the first five books of the Bible. I mean, they don't, just go through scriptures and do Bible school stuff. They have to memorize the first five verses of, or first five books of the Bible. So they knew the word. Not only did they know the word, but they practiced the word every day in the temple. They worked with their father. And the high priest was the leader. He was the one that looked, watched over the sacrifices. He was the one that would bless people and, and pray over people. He's the one that prayed over Hannah. You know, and when he prayed over Hannah, she had a son. But God was going to use that son to try to get Eli to repent. The thing is here is the reason these boys would not follow their father's warning at this point was because he was doing the same thing. I mean, he was lazy. He did not keep his house together. It says in here that um, they broke the covenant rules one of the things was was um, they would put meat in a pot and they would stick a fork in it and whatever came up, the priest would get it, but they would burn the fat first because that was the first fruit. They would burn the fat first. Well, Eli and his sons would say, give me the meat, give it to me raw, and they would keep the, the fat. They wouldn't let them burn it. And, just, and he, they had um, temple prostitutes that they um, solicited in the, in the temple. So I asked God, I said, what does this have to do with right now? Well, everything. It has everything to do with it. We've got people that have leaders that play off of the richness of the word, healing, prosperity. I mean, I'm talking about word people that draw people in by, uh, how's, how do I want to put it? The way that he uh, it says in here that he prospered off of, off of the people. And when you look at leaders today, they take something that's good of God and they throw it out there and then they, they take the very best from all of that. They're not giving it rightly. They're not giving it in context. They're making it the source instead of Jesus Christ and the kingdom himself. And they reap from that. 
And so I believe that as I preach this, that, you know, we have to look within ourselves too, you know, how do we minister to people? Are we ministering the kingdom of God or are we ministering, you know, the things of God, right? You go to somebody and even if you're ministering salvation or healing or prosperity or repentance or whatever, are you ministering that or are you ministering Jesus? Because if you're ministering Jesus, all of that comes into play. Well, they weren't doing that. They, they had, well, I'll tell you what they did. Um, now, the boy Samuel grew and was in favor both with the Lord and with men. Now, this next verse, this is the first warning. Obviously, somebody had warned Eli before about what was going on in the temple. He, he obviously was hearing from the people of God, your sons. I mean, that's pretty sad when the people of God have to come and tell the priest, your sons are are creepy and they're messing up the temple. And they st- and um, Hophni and Phile- Phineas did not repent and neither did Eli. There was just a little slap on the wrist and then they went on their way. Well, in the meantime, Samuel's growing up in the temple. And what I think is very precious about this is Samuel's being brought up underneath this same man, but he has a hunger for God. And so he... God's mercies on him, and he's raising up. And see, that's what I'm seeing in the body of Christ right now is that we've got the corrupt system. But I'm going to prove to you in Scripture here that he's bringing up someone right beside it, someone that's going to take this and run with it. But we have to decide. You know, it didn't say they separated those two kingdoms. It says those two kingdoms were in the same house. One was serving God and one was it. And that's where the distinction is going to come in, and I'm going to show you that. So Eli is getting ready to be warned again. It says, a man of God came to Eli and said to him, Thus has the Lord said, I plainly revealed myself to the house of your father, um, your forefather Aaron, when they were in Egypt in bondage to the Pharaoh's house. Moreover, I selected him out of all the tribes of Israel to to be my priest, to offer on my altar, and to burn incense, and to wear an ephod before me. And I gave from then on to the house of your father all the offerings of the Israelites made by fire. Why then do you kick and trample upon and treat with contempt my sacrifice and my offering, which I command and honor your sons above me by fattening yourself upon the choicest parts of every offering of my people Israel? And what I said before was, that's what God is saying. Why? Why are you taking the choicest things of my kingdom and fattening up the people on it and fattening up yourself, but yet you're trampling me under your feet? Why are you doing that? And Eli's listening to this man tell him that. Therefore, the Lord God of Israel says, I did promise that your house and that your father and your forefather Aaron should go... um, Go on and out before me forever. But now the Lord says, Be it far from me, for those who honor me I will honor, but those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. And he goes on and talks about how, you know, if you keep doing this, Eli, if you keep allowing this to happen, you're, you're, not only your generation is going to be cursed, but the next generation is going to be cursed, and the generation after that is going to be cursed. And Nobody's going to grow to an old age. They're all going to die early. And Eli's listening to this, and there's no response. There's no response. There's no response from when the people came to him. There was no response the this, this second time, and I'm going to show you one more time. And that's where we have to be because if you think about Eli and you think about his sons, they were brought up in the temple, and they were made to be something that they weren't. You know, the people were probably worshiping them because of all of the mess up. And all they had to do was repent. That's all they had to do was listen. God's warning them. Remember Mike said God warns you and warns you and warns you. But then there's so much he can do and then the enemy comes in and does his thing. And you see that over and over and over again through the word of God. This is not just one time. It's over and over again. Well, we can look at this and think, well, that was for them, this is for that. But God does that with us, too. Even in the small things of our heart, he'll come and he'll warn us over and over and over again. And the more you say no to him, the more you ignore him, you harden your own heart. 
God does not ever turn on his people. He, we turn on him. He's always there. He's always willing to forgive. He's always willing to change. But we turn on him because we harden our heart. <clears throat> so the, in chapter 3, it says, Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. The word of the Lord was rare and precious in those days. There was no frequent or widely spread vision. Why do you think that is? How many, how many people now say God doesn't speak today? How many people say the vision that they have is back here? There's nothing ahead of them except heaven. There's no, nothing great about God on this earth except waiting to die and go to heaven because there's no vision because they quit listening to God speak. They think that this written word is the only thing that God speaks through, and they don't even believe that. They just read it, and, and they, there's no revelation. There's no life in it. Well, if the, if the leaders are teaching that, then they're going to produce a people that are these people here, and it's pretty sad at the end. And every time I read it, I cried because you've seen it over and over again. And I was saying, God, please don't let that happen to us. Please don't let us become so comfortable and so thinking that we are that close to him and have this thing come from behind us and kick our feet out from under us. We have to be a people that are always moving forward, always digging deeper, always coming closer to him, never thinking it's enough, never thinking we're comfortable. And it goes on to say, <clears throat> it goes on, and, and this is where, um, I don't know if all of you are familiar with Samuel, but Samuel was just little at this time, and God came to him and was saying his name, saying Samuel, and he didn't know who it was because God didn't speak in that temple. So he went to Eli because he thought Eli was calling him, and Eli said, no, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. And the second time, God called him again, and he said, um, Eli, did you call me again? He's like, no, go back to bed. And the third time he did, he said, God, it must be God calling you. Go back and listen to what he says and then tell me everything that he said to you. Well, this little boy must have been like maybe, I don't know, maybe he was below teenage years. Um, so, it, so I'm going to start in verse 9. It says, So Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, and your servant is listening. So Samuel went, and he laid down in his place, and the Lord came and stood and called as the other time, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Isn't that sweet how Samuel did that when God has been speaking to Eli all this time, and he, he has the nerve to tell Samuel, Go listen and say to the Lord, Speak, Lord, but he isn't listening. And God's speaking to him and has spoken to him, and he won't listen. Um, the Lord told Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which both ears of all who hear it shall tingle. And on that day I will perform against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. And I announce to him that I will judge and punish his house forever for the iniquity of which he knew for his sons were bringing a curse upon themselves and blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. Therefore I have sw sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for or purged with sacrifice or offering forever. Because he just wanted their heart. He just wanted them. It, it got to the point where sacrifice wasn't going to do anything because their heart even wasn't even in the sacrifice, so it wasn't going to do any good. So it says, then Samuel lay until morning, and then he opened the doors of the Lord, uh, Lord's house, and he was afraid to tell the vision to Eli, because I imagine it shook him, you know, um, the strength of this word. And of course, S Samuel respected Eli and loved Eli. Eli was like his father. And how many times do we come up against people that we have respected and that have taught us over the years, and then all of a sudden God gives you a word, and you have to turn and say, no, this is what God is saying. Can you imagine how frightening that would have been for him to do? But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, and he answered, here I am. 
Eli said, what is it he told you? Pray, do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he said to you. I mean, he's threatening him for one thing. And I, I don't know why Eli was so persistent because then when Samuel tells him, Samuel tells him the exact same thing the other two warnings were. And um, it says that, That, that Samuel grew, and it says, And the Lord continued to appear to sh in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in si Shiloh through the word of the Lord. So it said at the beginning of this chapter that the word wasn't prominent in those days, but by the end, after he gave that word and after he was obedient to give that word, then God could start speaking to him and work through him, and the separation began. So then you go on, and, um, of course, the Philistines come in, which is the enemy, and they came in, and they stole the Ark of the Covenant. And at the time that the Philistines so stole the Ark of the Covenant, not only were there many, many, many Israelites killed, but Hophni and Phinehas was killed, and when they came and told Eli, Eli fell off his chair and um, because he was so lazy and big and fat, like, you know, a lot of us are in the church, and a whole, as a whole, he fell off the chair and broke his neck, and he died. Well, at that time, one of, I don't know if it was Hophni or Phineas's wife was having a baby, and sh when she had the baby, the baby's name was Ichabod, which means God's glory has departed. And at that point in time, if anybody would have just turned towards God, it says, it says in here, you have disregarded me. God is saying to them, you've disregarded me. Yet they were surrounded by, they were surrounded by religion. They were surrounded by all of the ceremony. They were surrounded by the sacrifice and offering. They were surrounded by, by the praise on the out, outer, inner, over, you know, they were doing all the right things, but their heart was so far from God that it became deceived, because I'm sure that Eli was thinking in his heart, I could be wrong, but I'm sure Eli was thinking in his heart, well, I'm a priest of the Lord. Why wouldn't God speak to me? And I heard um, Steve Gray say one time, it doesn't matter who you are, you can sit there and think that God's speaking to you, but he's left a long time ago, because it's God in your image, and you're not hearing God. You're hearing other things. And so I, I wanted to speak this to us because Ichabod, we do not want Ichabod on our door. We don't want Ichabod on the door of the body of Christ. We do not want, we want even if that remnant comes up, we want it to be pure and holy without spot or wrinkle. And we want to be part of that. And it's very, very easy to get caught up. I mean, God showed me a long time ago that the Israelites, whenever they had a victory, they would build an altar at that victory, and they would keep going back to it to worship. We don't ever want to build an altar and stay in one place. We do not want to do that. We can remember things that have happened to encourage ourselves in the Lord that, yes, he is faithful, yes, he's going to do for us, yes, his word works, but we can't ever stay at that one place where it all, you know, like I've heard people talk like they've had healings and stuff like that like 30 years ago, and they're still talking about those healings 30 years ago, but their life has not changed past that 30 years. They're the same as they were 30 years ago, and you're like, how can that be? Well, it's because they've done this. They just stayed, and they didn't move on, and they did their ceremonies and everything, and God left a long time ago. Isn't that tragic? You know, and we're not exempt from that. As leaders, we need to understand that we are not exempt from that. We always need to be in God's presence, drawing on his spirit and letting him work with us, never becoming comfortable where we're at. The last scripture I want to read to you is out of um, Revelation. And I, God gave me this this afternoon, and I just really was kind of overtaken by it. But I'm going to read it 
I'm going to read it to you out of the Amplified, and then I'm going to read it to you out of um, the message. And this is talking to the church of Sardis. <clears throat> and I just really felt, like, you know, like God was correlating, you know, this and what I just read, because there's nothing new under the sun. This church, Sardis, was operational then. It was operational in Eli's day, and it's operational now. And so we just, you know, we go through all these churches. We want to pick and get them all together, the good things that are in these churches, and make it one body. And to the angel of the assembly, the church in Sardis write, these are the words of him who has the seven spirits of God, the sevenfold Holy Spirit, and the seven stars. I know your record and what you are doing. You are supposed to be alive, but in reality you are dead. Rouse yourselves and keep awake and strengthen and invigorate what remains and is on the point of dying. For I have not found a thing that you have done, any work of, of yours, meeting the requirements of my God or perfect in his sight. And what he's saying is it doesn't matter how many sacrifices you make. It doesn't matter how many songs you sing. It doesn't matter how much money you give. It doesn't matter how much time you spend in church. If you don't want him, it ain't going to mean nothing. So call to mind the lessons you, you received and heard. Continually lay them to heart and obey them and repent. In case you will not rouse yourselves and keep awake and watch, I will come upon you like a thief, and you will not know or suspect at what hour I will come. And isn't that what happened to Eli? God came to him, and he wasn't ready. And so he didn't hear the word, and it didn't get engrafted in him, and he, it didn't bring him life because he's, he did all these things, and he's a type and shadow of what the priests are like now. We are priests. Anybody who has given themselves to Christ becomes a priest. And how we, how we take that responsibility and live it out will mean the difference between the kingdom coming and us just sitting in a church somewhere with no life thinking we're doing the right thing. Yet you still have a few persons' names in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes and they shall walk with me in white, because they are worthy and deserving. Thus shall he who, come, who conquers is victorious, be clad in white garments, and I will not erase or blot out his name from the book of life, and I will acknowledge him as mine, and I will confess his name openly before my Father and before his angels. He who is able to hear, let him listen to and heed what the Holy Spirit says to the assembly of the churches. And it says that after every time he speaks to a church. If you have ears to hear, listen to what he's saying. And that's what he was doing to Eli, was saying, listen to what I'm saying. I don't want this to happen to you, but if you continue in this behavior, the enemy's going to come in, he's going to steal the presence of God, and Ichabod is going to be written on your door that the glory of God has departed. And that's what God is saying to his church in this hour is that if you don't listen to what I'm saying, the enemy's going to come and he's going to steal what little presence is left and Ichabod's going to be on your door and you're going to be there and the enemy's going to come and he's going to take your life and you won't know what hit you. At, God was being so gracious, wasn't he? He kept coming to Eli and telling him through different people. And the reason he had to come through men of God and through Samuel was because he wasn't hearing God for himself. And he was supposed to be the one that was hearing God. It, you know, he, had, he rose Samuel up to be a prophet, but he was supposed to be the teacher of how that was supposed to happen, and he wasn't doing that. And we have to be careful of that too, that we've got people in our midst that God has put us over or around, and we have to make sure that we are speaking the word of God and not our own opinions and thoughts, but what he is saying you know, because I know I've heard a lot of people say, well, God told me this and God told me that and I'm supposed to do this and I'm supposed to do that. And really, when we, as close as we get to God, it's, it's real special when he speaks to you, isn't it? It's not like he's speaking to you every minute, though I'm sure he is speaking every minute, we just don't pick it up. But when he does speak to you, it's something powerful, isn't it? 
It's not like you're having a conversation with your next door neighbor. It's God speaking to you. It's precious. It's awesome. It almost brings you to your face sometimes. It's so powerful. And it can be just two or three words, and you're like, oh, Father God. <laughs> you know, it, it's not a common thing. It's not something that we should just take lightly. Oh, God told me this, and God told me that. I don't know who, whose God is talking to you, but our God, when he speaks, things thunder. And he's awesome, and he's like that mighty rushing river like we've talked about. Sometimes he comes in a whisper, sometimes he comes in thunder, but when he does, it's always powerful. And we should always be grateful when he speaks to us. And when he says turn, we need to turn, because he's trying to save our lives. He wants a body. He wants that remnant. He wants it so much. And I want to be that remnant might help if I got out of Psalms. I just want to read that out of um, the message. I thought it was really good out of the message. Three. Write this to Sardis, to the angel of the church, the one holding the seven spirits of God in one hand and a firm grip on the seven stars with the other, speaks. I see right through your works. You have a reputation for big vigor and zest, but you're dead, stone dead. Up on your feet, take a breath. Maybe there's life in you yet, but I wouldn't know it by looking at your busy work. Nothing of God's work has been completed. Your condition is desperate. Think of the gift you once had in your hands, the message you heard with your ears. Grasp it again and turn back to God. If you pull the covers back over your head and sleep on, oblivious to God, I'll return with you least, when you least expect it and break into your life like a thief in the night. You still have a few Christians in Sardis who haven't ruined themselves wallowing in the muck of the world's ways. They'll walk with me on parade. They've proved their worth. Conquerors will march in, vi in a victory par parade, their names indelible in the book of life. I'll lead them up and present them by name to my father and his angels. Are your ears awake? Listen. Listen to the wind, words, the spirits blowing through the churches. And we want, we want his wind's word to blow through us, don't we? We want to be part of that army that's coming through. And God, you can feel it. You can feel it on the inside. You can feel it when you pray. You can feel it when you read these scriptures that we are so on the edge of something wonderful. And, but we could still miss it. And we don't want to miss it. We want to be part of this. And we want to be part of it together. And the only way we're going to do that is to seek God with our whole heart, give him our devotion and our commitment, and let him speak to us no matter what it is, and, tr and to try never to say no to him. That when he says something to us, and it's something that we need to hear, we need to hear it and take it to heart and not disregard him. That word really got to me, because disregard means that you heard it, but you didn't think it was important enough to take take it in. And I don't ever want to be accused of disregarding my Savior. And he is a wonderful Savior. He saves us from something every day, every minute, things we don't even know he's saving us from. He is so faithful and he is so good. And his word is so alive and active. And it want, I mean, I believe that if we'll just take the simplicity of the word, that's, it is simple. It's the same thing over and over and over again. He's just saying, would you guys please just love me and, and want to be my people and I'll be your God? He says that over and over again. I want to be your God. I want you to be my people. It's, there's nothing complicated about that. You don't have to jump through hoops. You don't have to do anything. You just have to want him. And, you know, we want to get there, don't we? So that's all I had. didn't come out near as powerfully as I felt it, but any questions? Okay. In 1 Samuel 3, um, verse 18, and this is, you know, the next morning when Eli's wanting Samuel to tell him what God said to him. 
It says, And Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing. And Eli said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. And there is a spirit that runs through the church like that that says, if it's whatever will. is going to happen is going to happen. Mm-hmm. If it's God's will to happen, if they get it, you know, I've, I've heard of leaders who say, you know, about the teenagers in their church, if they're going to get it, they'll get it. And if they're not going to get it, they won't get it. And, and it's almost sounds like Eli saying, my kids are just the way they are. And if this is what God wants to do, then, you know, it's up to him to do mm-hmm. whatever. Like, they're, like Eli had no part right. in he had no doing anything in to change yeah. it. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to bring that scripture up. That was an important thing I forgot. But I was going to say is that haven't you, I've heard this over and over. Maybe it's always being said, but it's just caught my ear lately how, um, how people say there, there's a reason for everything. You know, and you're like, no, there's, there is. Doing there what you're supposed yeah. to be doing. Everything happens for a reason. That's what they say. Everything happens for a reason. That's what he's saying there. Everything happens for a reason. If God's going to do it, he's going to do it. If he's not, he's not. Well, doesn't that relinquish you of responsibility? You know, and almost blaming God. You know, it's like, well, if he's going to punish us, he's going to punish us because that's the way Eli was looking at God, you know? And he shouldn't have been, because if he knew God, he would know that God wasn't doing that to him. But, you know, it just takes that little tweak in your spirit to just tweak you from one side to the other. And, you know, we always have to remember how good he is. And that's why I thought, you know, because it says in there that God was going to punish him and kill him and all that. But he didn't. The Philistines did, the enemy. And the enemy was even nervous about going in to the Israelite camp. They were, it says they were nervous. What? Because they had more regard for God than they Eli had more regard did. for God. Yeah. They, they were nervous about doing it. And I think they were a little bit surprised they won and that they actually got the ark and they were teaching it almost like, you know, should we really have this? You know, you can hear it in the reading that they were a little trepid, trepidatious t- to have it, you know. And how, how do we do that? You look in the world and you talk to people that don't know anything about God, but they're respectful. They're respectful of the presence of God. And then you have Christians who talk during the sermon, who are texting on their cell phones, who if somebody bows, they laugh. You know, I mean, it's, it's pretty pathetic, you know, because I know people who wouldn't know God if he ran into them sideways but if you say something to them about God, th- if you bow your head to pray over your meal, they may not pray, but they're respectful enough to bow their head, you know, and it shouldn't be like that, you know. So God de- c- demands and commands attention, and we need to be the people that do that. Um, I liked in 1 Samuel 3, also, like, where, well, first, it reminds me of a lot of families today, even, too, how kids are being brought up out of that and are following God, and they, and they continue to go forward no matter what the parents do, no matter what parents think, and I've seen that not only in my own life, but in other people's lives, too, where they're one in God, they're one in God, and then they have, like, the Eli's, you mm-hmm. know, that aren't hearing, and, and um, also another thing where talks about um, Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing, and Eli said, it is the Lord, let him do what seems good to him. Samuel grew, the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And if you look at that, I look look at that as if when God tells us something that we don't let any of his words that he speaks to us fall to the ground either, that we take every single word he says and we apply it, we don't add, we don't subtract, we do exactly what it tells us to do because that's, mm-hmm. see, and that's, that's where a lot of people get mixed up is they hear one word, like someone might hear something for me to say Des Moines, and like I was going to go to Des Moines, and they were to say like Des Moines, what does that mean? Like people could say, oh, you're supposed to go, or oh, you're not supposed to go. You know, they put, they add stuff onto it, which makes it uh, muddied water and like not right, and it's mm-hmm. not clear. And so when I see that, I'm like, when you, when it says, let none of his words fall to the ground. Like, 
think how many times during the day even that we like if we mess up or whatever we do we let the words of the lord like fall to the ground when we sin or and and how we should constantly not be in a comfort zone constantly be um stretching out and getting stretched and pulled and like you know, out so that we can start not letting his words fall to the ground and actually pick them up and take them with us and give them to people and, and help others and show. And I like also what you said about showing Jesus when we minister, not his stuff. Not, yeah. Not his stuff, but showing Jesus. Um, I took it to mean that his words didn't fall, that Samuel's words didn't fall to the ground either because his heart was in the right place and people trusted him because they saw him following after God. Eli's words would have fallen to the ground because nobody trusted him and when he would say, thus saith the Lord, which I'm sure he did, mm-hmm. nobody listened to him because they, 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 they didn't respect him. They didn't think he was following God, so his words would fall to the ground, which means they're disregarded. He disregarded God, and the people disregarded him because nobody was regarding God. So, anybody else? Do you have anything? Terry, do you have anything? Oh, I I couldn't see you over her. (laughs) Okay, who, who wants to pray? Here, use this. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Father God, I thank you, Lord, for tonight. I thank you, Father, um, for all of us to be able to come together and praise you, Father, and just dwell in your peace, Lord. It was so awesome. and. Thank you, Lord, for the teaching tonight and the anointing that came off of it, Father, to give us more revelation throughout the week as we think about this, Lord, and as we apply it to our lives, Father. And I thank you, Lord, that I never want to be in a comfort zone, that I always want to be growing and stretching in you, and that every single one of these people in here want to continue to grow in you and and go get past where they've been before, Father, and never feel like, like Cassie said, never feel like they've they're close enough to God or anything like that because we never are. We can always grow. We can always be closer to you, Father. And I thank you so much in Jesus' name. (laughs) Thank you, Father, for tonight and just speaking your word through Cassie. And we don't want to get stunted in growth with you, Father. We just want to grow and grow and grow and We just want more of you, and we don't ever want to stop wanting you. We love you. (laughs) Mm -hmm. 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 Mm